to Leitner. Puts it up. You're listening to the Culture State Podcast. Get ready. Welcome to another edition of the Culture State Podcast. Man, I'm so excited about this show. Mm-hmm. We're going to interview a guy by the name of Kevin Wilson. But before we tell you about him, I am Chris Lee. That is my man, Dennis Jamel Cox, because I haven't said your middle name in a, in a long time. So I have to make sure people know that, right? It's been a minute, Chris. It's been a minute since you've done that. But I appreciate that and I respect it. So, you know, just so people have the full government. Uh, so this is the show, Culture State, where we like to celebrate things that come out of the state of North Carolina. And typically, we interview people that you may have known because you've watched them play basketball. Maybe you've listened to their music. Maybe you've watched them wrestle. Something like that. Mm-hmm. This is a case where you may not know this person's name straight out. You may not know the name Kevin Wilson when you clicked on this particular podcast. But then, if you listen, you'll see that, oh, wait a minute, this is an up-and-coming uh, director, and maybe you've seen his work because on um, Netflix you have the Untold series, and there's the And One story that's on there, the new documentary on what happened with And One, the shoe company, and he is the director of that particular do- documentary. Yep. He's also from Durham, North Carolina, and a graduate from North Carolina A&T State University. You know, it's really cool when you look back for people at our age, people in our mid thirties, the and one mixtape tour, the basketball tour from the late nineties, early two thousands really infiltrated pop culture as we knew it. I think a mm-hmm. lot of people may recognize, Oh baby. A, the, yeah. That's just a, a, something that always rang out from watching those videos. I remember I bought a pair of and one shoes and got uh, a videotape with it. Uh, so I could see it. I remember like actually calling up my guy, my friend Ashton, he lived in Winston-Salem. He came to High Point and was like, you know, you got to sleep over Friday night because we got to watch N1. <laughs> and that was like a legit thing, yeah. <laughs> you know, for us. And so, um, you know, it was it was really cool. And then to, to go out the next day to try to try everything, even though I was horrible at basketball already, I thought I could do the tricks, which was interesting. But uh, it definitely had an impact on my life for sure. Uh, let's talk to the director of this And One documentary that's on Netflix right now that you can watch. His name is Kevin Wilson Jr., cool guy from Durham, North Carolina. You get a chance to hear his story and how he's trying to impact the world of film right here on the Culture State Podcast. That documentary is two and a half years in the making, and uh, we really you know, appreciate the support and the love for it. Absolutely. We'll, we want to thank you for, for such uh, a great piece of work. Um, you know, so first off, uh, before we get into your actual story and how you, you know, what led you to get to this level, um, this documentary to me, I learned a lot that I didn't realize that was going on with and one also didn't like put together, put two and two together when that, that famous Nike commercial being one of the, (laughs) the cutoff points where, you know, and one starts to go down. Uh, what do you remember from N one as a kid and, and what was it like for you to kind of relive this through the different information and understanding uh, everybody's story, how it got to uh, where, where it is right now? Yeah, man. I mean, like a lot of people and one was a big part of my childhood. You know, it brought a lot of my friends and I together uh, people who I probably wouldn't be friends with. And maybe, you know, we came together just because we were trying to, you know, emulate the moves that we saw on the tape and, um, I say all the time, you know, obviously being from North Carolina, I'm a huge basketball fan. I'm a Tar Heel fan myself. But like, you know, unless your parents were really wealthy, you know, you couldn't really afford to go to those games. So I, I never was able to go to the UNC basketball games or Duke basketball games or any of that, you know. So for me, the first time I remember actually going into an arena to watch a game was when and one had um, come to town. I can't remember if they were in Raleigh at um, where State plays, or if it was in, or if we drove up to Charlotte. I don't remember which one it was, but I remember they came to town, and my friends and I went and saw them. And I just like, as an adult looking back, it made me realize that and one made that type of experience accessible for people who were kind of shut out from the beginning. And like just in retrospect, it made me realize that that was their that was the culture. You know what I mean? It was, Mm. you know, the guys who didn't necessarily make it to the league. You know what I mean? For whatever reason, the guys who didn't get recruited by Duke or Kentucky, they were invited to travel the world and play. And um, I didn't know that I was experiencing it when I was a kid. But like that is what made it so attractive um, for me as a kid. And that is what 
made a created a culture especially like in north carolina in the middle schools and high schools and stuff it mm-hmm. created a culture around it and so um that was for me what was so exciting about being able to come back together and relive that moment meeting the guys you know and realizing that their experiences were just like ours you know just like the people who were viewing it and popularizing it by watching the tapes and bootlegging the tapes in, in our case um that was their experience as well you know what i mean being able to live out their dream i will real quick uh the one thing that always stood out to me that my friends always took over was some, somebody like did something on the basketball court pick up was, oh baby that was like, one of yeah, the big yeah, things yeah. that always stood out so yeah, i want to yeah. know from from your experience with this documentary how did and one and its culture infiltrate and influence pop culture and sports as a whole from what you've experienced yeah, I mean, the, the you know, the most obvious, you know, answer is because uh, DJ Set Free, you know what I mean? He was the one who came and took the uh, footage that he saw from the Rucker and had the genius idea to put music to it and create a mixtape out of it. And, you know, hip hop culture, you know, uh, it's huge, you know what I mean? But it hadn't found its way into intersecting with sports at that time. And so when he put the music to the to the uh, to the moves into the tapes like that and put it out into the world, everybody knew that that culture existed because they would play and rap and stuff like that at the course, but it just hadn't found its way to the mainstream. So when it did finally, um, it was familiar, you know what I mean? And people saw themselves in in what they were watching, and so I think that is what made it it so exciting because it was music hip hop it was already a part of the culture sports and stuff like that it was already a part of the culture i think a lot of times um when people feel like they're not represented and they finally see themselves represented they come out and support in droves you know what i mean and it's almost like you know like they said in the, in the documentary it's like lightning in a bottle it's kind of like relating it to something that happened in pop culture today it's kind of like black panther you know it's like mm-hmm. we know that this world exists You know, it just hadn't found its way to the mainstream. But when it finally does, you know, you know, it makes two billion dollars, you know. And so I think that is what ended up happening. And, um, you know, a lot of people with corporate financial interests, you know, they um, notice that and then they find a way to kind of keep it going in any way they can. That's what ended up happening with M1. It's like they're seeing that it's working. They're seeing that there's a community that is surrounding w- what's happening here. Um, and then they actually, you know, they invest financially into trying to keep it going. And so, um, you know, as a result, you know, the, the mixtape kind of took off and had a life for several years, you know, um, till it's ultimate uh, downfall, you know? Now I know there's a whole story here and we have to fill in the holes at a certain point, but uh, I wanted to know just like, just simply, how does a kid from Durham who went to a t to get his journalism degree uh, end up becoming the director for this project? Like, how does that end up happening? How did you get the call? And uh, how excited were you to to have this opportunity? Yeah, man. Well, I mean, that story begins back in 2018. Um, I, be- I was in film school at NYU and... Um, I got nominated for an Oscar for a short film that I made. Um, And as a result of that, you know, the industry had its eye on me and I had gotten, you know, signed with an agent at, um, you know, Hollywood. And that particular agent um, just so happened to be representing the creators of the series Untold. And so they were just kind of, you know, when, when, when you get your start in Hollywood, they, you do what's called general meetings, which is, they set you up with all these different, um, you know, studios. They just send you on meetings so that, that you can get to know them and they can get to know you because basically Hollywood has all these projects that are not developed yet. And they just, you know, have these meetings so that in the off chance they meet somebody who might check a box and they'll say, oh, like, let's invite them to do this project or whatever. And so that's what I was doing for um, some months. And um, and then I ended up meeting the Way Brothers, McLean and Chapman Way, and they were talking about the series. 
Um, and the M1 project was already being developed, you know, and so we just so happened to start talking about sports and M1. And, um, and I started just expressing my enthusiasm about the subject because once again, it's, it's an experience that I lived with my friends and um, I started talking about the, my point of view and I have a very particular point of view about the animal players and whether they received the compensation that they deserved. And it's a conversation that I felt had gone um, unexplored, you know, in the telling of that story, mainly because I don't feel like the players got had ever received like a, the platform to express themselves fully. And I felt that the Untold series, um, because of who McLean and Chapman are, just as storytellers, was the perfect uh, platform for that because they're gritty, the storytelling is raw, and you know it just I felt was a perfect way to um, invite them in. And so I expressed my my point of view, and they invited me to make the make the film. And uh, we ended up shooting in 2020, actually January of 2020. Wow! And the series was supposed to the episode was supposed to come out in 2020, but um, the pandemic hit just as we wrapped. It delayed post production on other projects that were in the series, and um, and so then ours got pushed for a couple of years. Um, but nonetheless, um, I think it came out at the right time um, uh, because um, the Thirty for Thirty one came out right before, and it left a lot of people wanting to know even more. You know what I mean? And so it kind of set us up. Um, to answer questions uh, that the other one didn't quite answer just because of time constraints and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so everything happened for in, 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 you know, in a beautiful way, in the way it was supposed to happen. So real quick, uh, even further back on Chris's question, what got you interested in, in studying film and, and doing mm. type projects like this? Like, where, where was the origin of that for you? Mm. Yeah, man, I have to tell you, growing up in Durham, there wasn't um, much access to the film industry in particular. Mm. But there is actually a camp that my mom sent me to when I was um, 16. And it's in Durham. It's called Youth Document Durham. Okay. And at that camp, um, at the time, it was early 2006, they were teaching kids how to do photography, how to um, do photojournalism, how to um, make documentaries. And so we we're actually going in, taking photos around Durham and putting them together for like installations and stuff and doing audio documentaries and such. And that program really ignited a passion of visual storytelling that I didn't realize at the time. Um, I was just really excited about what we we're doing at the time. I wanted to be an actor. I went to Hillside High School, um, and I was in the theater department there acting. And the um, theater di director at the time, his name is Mr. Wendell Tab. He just retired, um, but he taught all of the students about writing, and we all had to direct short plays in the program. And then he made me a student director for one of the main shows. Um, and so all of those things were working together to like fuel a passion that I didn't know existed at the time. Um, but then I went to North Carolina a and and I was acting in their department, but I was majoring in journalism. And long story short, I wanted to do more shows at a and in their theater department, but you have to be a theater major in order to continue to participate. And so instead of changing my major, I wrote a play and directed, directed a play. Um, at a and and they financed the play. And it was in 2009 that that happened. And after that, it's like, it kind of clicked. It's like, wow, this is actually what I've been, what I was being pushed to do all along. It wasn't necessarily acting. Acting was just kind of a, you know, a starting out point that kind of pushed me toward directing. So from 2000, I hadn't acted since 2009. It was just after that point, I started to focus all of my attention on developing the craft of filmmaking um, and, you know, all that was born here. It was what was born in North Carolina. Um, and through so many crazy experiences, um, you know, making stuff around North Carolina, leaving and making stuff in New York, 
um, I ended up where I am now, which is, you know, directing professionally and, um, you know, taking advantage of opportunities and kind of trying to curate my career a certain way so that I can continue to, you know, um, maintain the trust that I have from the audience who is following me right now. And I think it's, you know, an important thing as a filmmaker is to be able to like, be uh, picky, a little picky about what you choose to do. Because if you just start doing anything, in my opinion, if you just start doing anything and saying anything, um, then people aren't going to know what to come to you for. You know what I mean? So for me, it's like continuing to um, remember why I started doing what I started to do, why I started to do what I do. Um, you know, and honestly, you know, when I'm in a room with people in LA, I always tell them that I'm making stuff for people back home because the people back home, like my mom and cousins who are living in North Carolina, if they're not, if they're not rocking with what I'm doing, you know, then I've fallen into the trap of just trying to please other filmmakers. And I'm not really saying what I need to say, you know, that's big. Um, and shout outs to to A and T. Gail Wiggins has like a roster mm. out there that was so many mm. uh, amazing people that went there. I the setup there on campus because I, I felt like one of the things I like about A and T and my parents went to A and T as well is that it, it does feel like a, a, a community where everybody kind of supports each other and is yeah. very happy. I mean, I learned about you from another A and T person who's also yeah. from Durham. Um, so, you know, as, as far as like, you know, that community being able to be fostered with that, how did that kind of help you and give yeah. you the confidence to, to go after this thing that, you know, a lot of people from Durham don't have access to? Yeah, it gave me a lot of confidence, man. And like I said, the whole start of my career began right there. Um, and it was because I really wanted to be involved with the arts. Um, and I remember going to the vice chancellor for student affairs with a script when I was a student, I was 19 and I was like, Hey, I'm not a member of any organization. I'm just a student, but I really have a story that I want to tell. Um, and I'd like to do it on campus. I like to do it in this theater. Can you help me? And they read the script um, and came back and was like, here's 10 grand, go make what you want to make. And it was like, it was like, man, you know, um, if if that isn't support and putting your money where your mouth is, I don't know what is. And so it was not just that, but it was like the the campus, the university rallied around me. It was um, you know, Alpha Phi Alpha ended up co-sponsoring us. So they were like ushers and helping us promote the show. Um, a lot of the um a lot of other the Greek organizations on campus um were also like involved in like helping um shake kind of or just giving me a way to um practice what i do you know because after the play i would direct step show intro videos for the homecoming step shows okay. and so the 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 um the greek organizations would call me and say hey can you do this and it was an opportunity for me to make another short film like that's how i saw it It was like hey D delta sigma theta wants to make a step show intro video and it's going to play in the Greensboro Coliseum yeah. for everybody. Like that's an opportunity for me to make another short film that people see. Um, and so I would, they would let me put my name on it. You know, they would let me write directed by Kevin Wilson on it. And so at that point, because it was playing in front of so many people, it really, it really got me noticed on campus as like a filmmaker. And that gave me all the confidence in the world because now everybody's saying, Hey, you know, I saw you did, that intro video you did that play you know you're a filmmaker now um, can you do this for me and i had all the confidence in the world at that point and I, I honestly don't know if that could have happened anywhere else like i went to nyu for grad school and i didn't have the same experience you know at nyu as great of a school as it, as it is i sing its praises um it's very competitive you know what i mean and so it's like everybody at nyu is trying to they're kind of out for themselves and trying to build their own name. So the support that I felt at a and that it wasn't the same. And so like, in terms of confidence and support and lifting each other up, you know, that well, experience that I had at a and I hadn't had it anywhere else, like in, at least in an academic institution, you know? All right. So going through a and the stuff you talked about when you were 16 years old in Durham, building up to that and getting to where you are now to direct this. Hmm. What was the biggest thing that you learned that you had no idea about 
the and one tour that you learned while while making this? Mm. Well, I mean, I mean, the first I'm sure, I'm sure you learned a lot, but yeah, what was like yeah. some of the biggest takeaways? That biggest, you yeah, I didn't realize until I started to make the documentary that the three founders were, you know, three white guys from Warp Business School. You know, until I started to research the doc. That got me you know, too. I, I, I never, I thought it was a black owned company. <laughs> when I was like, yeah, yeah. You, you would think that. And, um, you know, it was kind of one of those things where I had an impression about what it would be when I started talking to the guys. And even when I was talking to one of them, on, I won't get into like black sense and stuff like that, but I was talking to one of them on the phone and I thought it was black. You know what I mean? Uh, and then we met in person and I was shocked. You know what I mean? And so, um, I mean, people have their opinions about what that means in terms of, um, you know, white people coming in, uh, becoming participants in the culture and stuff like that. But my job as a filmmaker wasn't to judge, you know what I mean? It wasn't to cast my personal you know, thoughts on um, what it means for three white guys to come and build a brand that, you know, um, I guess takes a culture that already exists, streetball culture into the mainstream and profiting off of that. I was shocked at um, just personally my ability to kind of remove my personal judgments from that, you know, because if it were Two years ago, you know, I probably wouldn't, may not have taken that same approach. Um, but I think it was like necessary for the story that we were about to tell. Um, the other thing, man, was like um, just the sheer influence that it had globally. Like I'm, I knew that um, for me, for Black folks, you know, growing up in the United States, it was a big deal because you know we were seeing ourselves reflected in the mainstream but i didn't realize that it had reached tokyo and australia and brazil and all those things like I, you know and the, and that they still have an impact there you know i get messages even to this day from folks in russia in the philippines in italy in japan you know i had an interview the other day with someone from australia you know, because the mixtape tour had such a profound impact on their lives as well. And so, you know, you think about that and you think about um, how, you know, in Hollywood, there's this thing before Black Panther, you wouldn't believe it. But before Black Panther came out, the big thing in Hollywood was that black black culture doesn't sell overseas. You know, that, you know, Hollywood isn't going to invest in a certain amount of money in um, certain properties if it involves black stories because you know there's not a global audience for black content but you look back in the late 1990s man early 2000s and you see hot sauce a brother from you know georgia you know he's you know got a huge fan base you know over in uh, singapore you know what i mean and so <laughs> It's like, you know, that it kind of dispels that thought, you know, and so that is what I was really excited about, you know what I mean, um, to know that the culture has found its way to every corner of the globe. I know that you're still, you know, uh, making your name uh, with what you're doing, but uh, have you had any thought of coming back, maybe teaching a class at um, at a t or maybe holding camps for uh, potential fil filmmakers around Durham? What are your thoughts on potentially giving back in the future? Ooh. That's a good question, man. Yeah, I had actually been talking with, well, before she retired, Ms. Wiggins was, uh, Gail Wiggins was trying to get me to come back and teach a class. And I was telling her that um, A&T really needs to develop a film program. And that's mm -hmm. what I've been trying to work with the, with the university on is just developing a curriculum specifically for students who want to be filmmakers or commercial directors or music video directors, because there's an entire industry right now who are trying to like um, get more black storytellers and more people of color who want to be storytellers working. But uh, so they're like going out to universities to try to create pipelines and programs, partnerships with the universities and such, but you need an established curriculum for them to do that. And so for me, it's like NT has really talented folks there. They have equipment, they have a studio. Let's create a curriculum 
um, that teaches, you know, students how to properly bid on commercials, bid on, uh, you know, you know, to advertising agencies. They can go out when they graduate and, you know, bid for a commercial and go make $10,000 a day uh, as their day rate as a director. You know what I mean? So that they can have some steady income, you know what I mean? Once they graduate. It's not a bad rate. Um, oh. It's not a bad rate. <laughs> and that is on the low end. That's the starting rate for a commercial director. And so just, it's like. Just work once a month. You're good. Yeah. Work once a month and then go make whatever film you want to make. And so like, that's what I've been trying to like get, you know, the a and the powers that be there to understand like, hey, there's a whole industry out here that you know, the folks at NYU and Columbia and Harvard and Princeton, they're training their students to take advantage of that. And we need to be doing the same, you know what I mean? So that, you know, when we, our students graduate, we can be just as competitive, you know? And so that's kind of the stuff that I've been talking to them about, you know what I mean? And, you know, I would teach a class, you know, uh, for but for that reason, because, uh, you know, someone like myself who was young would have really, benefited from that kind of information you know because it's more than just it's more than just coming out and trying to make a movie yeah you gotta like in my opinion find a way to survive you know whether you're gonna move to la new york or stay in north carolina you gotta find a way to fund your dream you know what i mean because like when you when you come out you're gonna be making your own movies you're going to be paying for your movies yourself. You know, no one's going to give you a bunch of money to make something you haven't made anything. It's like, how do you do that? You know, it's like by doing other jobs that, you know, give you the financing, the backing. So just helping students f- figure out how to do that is my goal, you know, moving forward, you know. I can't wait to see what happens with mm-hmm. that. Uh, it was great to meet you. And, um, you know, I-, I can't wait to see uh, where your career takes you and, and we could say, hey, we interviewed that guy. So hopefully mm-hmm. we'll get a chance to stay in touch and glad Appreciate that we, we've had a, uh, a chance to to hear your story and get a chance to tell uh, people a little bit more about this, uh, this, this rising North Carolinian. Thanks, man. I appreciate you, my brother. We want to thank my man, Kevin Wilson Jr. for joining us on the Culture State Podcast. Really cool to talk to him. Mm-hmm. And it, it's cool to have somebody that uh, works behind the scenes in something that you don't necessarily – know their name immediately but now you get a chance to know their name and and uh you know check his work um and see where he's going to go from here on out so it'll be really cool and i can't wait to see uh, a major motion film that he gets a chance to direct and hopefully it's about the state of north could you imagine what and one would have been like had they had social media like we have today it would have been crazy (laughs) and one was built for instagram and TikTok. it just was you know, if that stuff was around 20 years ago, who knows what and one would be right now? And honestly, you can honestly say that if it weren't for and one, maybe the idea to use basketball as content uh, for social media wouldn't be as big as it is right now. Right. Like because, yeah. you know, if you basketball is probably the most shared sport, I would say, uh, on social media. Oh, yeah. Uh, and NBA is a big reason for that because they they bought into that. NBA bought into it and they, they allow people to use their footage, um, you know, without having to pay hefty fines and fees. But uh, it, it also basketball has become so global um, that it almost becomes its own language. Right. And mm-hmm. so and one, I think, has a huge piece of that. And you see people, you know, you know, showing the different uh, moves that they'll do in the different you know layup packages that they have. And that is all birthed from and one and so uh you know I, I definitely think that and one has a huge piece into you know the way we consume and look at basketball today for sure 100 percent. it was awesome talking to kevin i can't wait to talk to him again and can't wait to see what he comes up with next absolutely please follow us on social media at chrisley tv at the fan rookie at culture state pod that's on twitter and on ig and uh, also be, be sure to listen to us on culture state saturday 99.9 the fan saturday mornings 10 to noon, uh, we're going off. You're going to hear bars coming from me. You're going to hear singing coming from Dennis. You're going to hear all kinds of great things. Also, you can watch that on WRELsportsfan.com and WRL Sports Plus. Yep. So make sure you check us out there as well. And also go to 99 Other Fans' YouTube page. We drop some content there as well. Yes. Thank you so much for watching and listening. See you next time. The Culture State Podcast, part of the Capital Broadcasting Podcast Network, with new shows coming out every Wednesday. 
Download and subscribe from wherever you get your podcasts, including the WREL Sports Fan app.